so that way you can start recording yeah. right away. I'm also uh, recording it on the computer. Zoom has been having iCloud issues. Okay, Curtis, do you want to go ahead and make some remarks? Uh, yes, um, okay. I just want to make sure that uh, the screen, the main screen is still being shared. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'd like to just kind of start off with um, just my uh, excitement of how many people have jumped on board um, to participate in this. Um, I was expecting quite a few. Uh, for there to be a max, to hit our max of 300 uh, is pretty exciting, but also shows the need of um, educators in Missouri right now in this, we call it a time of crisis, uh, to come together and find out um, exactly what it is that they need to do to best educate their kids. I think this is an exciting thing for Missouri educators. Um, and uh, it shows how much we care and, and I applaud you guys for, for jumping on board. So, um, so just kind of the logistics of the session and how everything's going to go. Uh, Q and a format, um, go ahead and uh, submit your questions. Um, feel free to submit them, um, in a group, uh, format. If, if you feel like you want your question to be more, um, hidden, uh, I, I would suggest sending that question to your, uh, Tom, send that to Tom, Tom Harrison, uh, if you want that to be sent privately. Um, so Tom is going to be the one that's going to be member, uh, I'm sorry, uh, monitoring that process and uh, getting those questions to our panel. And um, also, uh, we're going to record this session, obviously. And the recording of that will be um, on the Advantage uh, website. Um, Kendra, probably by the end of the day, since I'm able to doing it on my computer, correct? As long as we can get the recording, we should be able to have that up this afternoon. All right. All right, so at this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of uh, our Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education folks, um, Bev Luke DeMeyer, Dana Welch, and Ginger Henry. Uh, we also have some uh, practitioners out there in the field, um, people that are experts and are right there alongside everybody else uh, making things happen. And from Clinton County, R3, uh, up in Plattsburgh, Missouri, Brittany Delameter. And Got it. Nixa, <laughs> I did. <laughs> from Nixa. Karen McKnight, and from Maryville, Craig Ford. So I'm going to go ahead and just start it off with a couple of general questions as uh, Tom is putting questions together that he's receiving. And uh, so I'll just start this uh, out with the panel of uh, what are important steps for districts to continue for special education learners during this time? Um, what are the important compliance issues? Sure. Okay. Um, I can go. I can go ahead if that's okay, or unless somebody else has something. Go ahead. Um, so the first thing it says, what are important steps? Um, the first thing we wanted to do is make sure that everything that we were offering regular education students, we were also offering to our special education students. Um, and so right now what we're doing is we have, we're just providing learning opportunities um, through Google Classroom. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were offering all those opportunities to our special education students while keeping confidentiality. So we downloaded an app that I would recommend for everyone that's going through this right now and it's Seesaw because it's individualized for each student. And so you can send specific learning opportunities to the student without everyone seeing who is in that. So I can create one activity and then send it to various students without people seeing, oh, also this kid's in that class, this kid's also in that class receiving that service. Um, and then as far as compliance goes, 
we are still um, meeting all those deadlines. Um, the only ones that we're struggling with is those initial evaluations. But one of the first things we did is said, okay, we need to contact parents and ask them what um, is their preferred method to meet for these IEP meetings. So sometimes we call them and we just start merging calls. Sometimes we do Google Hangouts. It's kind of at the at the parents discretion how they want to do that but basically it's just doing what's best for the kids maintaining confidentiality and then do trying to just meet the parents where they're at all right uh bev is there anything additionally you want to talk about when it comes to um, the uh, compliance issues no i think that was a perfect explanation about how districts will handle this appropriately um, there, there, ha there isn't any authority on the part of the state to, you know, extend deadlines for IEP meetings or initial evaluations. Um, so, I mean, those are the rules we have to operate within. And really, it's going to hinge on being able to figure out how to get your work done using alternate means, using um, Google Hangouts and conference calls and things like that to the best that you can do and documenting um, if there was, you know, if you didn't meet a deadline, why that was. I can tell you at NICSA, we're going to be starting with our full implementation of all, our alternative methods of instruction at AMI next um, on April the 6th. So we've got, an, we're still a week away from that. But our biggest piece has been providing guidance to our general education teachers with our SPED right alongside of that because um, you know, that free and appropriate public education just changed for every student across Missouri and in NICSA. And so we have to really figure out where is that new general education learning target? What are our gen ed teachers putting out there? We wanna make sure our gen ed teachers are doing something in a very consistent manner so that us as special educators can come in and support that. But we have to know what they're doing and we needed to put some parameters in that. So we did that through um, our alternative methods of instructions when we developed that. Um, we have to adjust our supports and we might not know what's best for each student right out of the gate. We know that we're gonna have to adjust those supports, but we've got our, our general education teachers thinking about those accommodations and modifications on the front end of the assignments they're sending out. Um, and our, our teams are, of educators are on those. We have, we're a PLC community and we're continuing with our PLC meetings in a virtual environment as well. And so they're really trying to connect as well on that piece. Um, our third quarter cut off right before spring break and right before all of this happened. So we've really hammered home to our staff that these third quarter progress notes are probably some of the most important ones we'll, we will be writing. Um, because this is ultimately our baseline that we're taking into some of these decisions we're going to have to make down the road in, on compensatory services. So we really um, asked them to hone in on all of their data that they collected to make sure that those third quarter progress notes look the best and most um, have the best picture of where the student is at prior to this closure. Um, yeah, timelines are, a, are an issue for sure. Um, we're trying to adhere to all of our um, annual deadlines as well as our three-year reval deadlines. Um, even if we're doing those those reds without assessment at this time and, and knowing that this what we're dealing with is probably going to create a little bit of a fall rush for us because the IEPs we're writing right now may not be appropriate for kids when we get back in the fall or whenever we do get back and so we know we'll have to make some amendments and adjustments and just be okay with what that means. Um, our initial evaluations are certainly a challenge. Um, we're putting those on pause I, there's no other way to do it. Um, we're gonna have to be out of compliance in some areas as far as timelines go, but we're just communicating with those parents what that means, what we had accomplished and finished up until this point, and what that looks, what we think that'll look like we are able to resume. Awesome. I would, re I would reiterate that the same, and Maribel, we're starting April 6th also, kind of um, taking this week to unload everything and try to figure out how that's gonna look have a lot of Zoom meetings that, that um, we haven't had in the past and, and trying to get a hold of the, that type of technology and get comfortable with it, I think is the biggest thing. Um, giving those opportunities, um, we're also trying to utilize as much technology <laughs> that we haven't used in the past. I think getting comfortable with that and being flexible and not being afraid to you know try some things that, that may not work initially, but 
trying to see what works out best for your students. I, I think that's going to be the key to this. All right. Um, so we kind of touched a little bit on this, but generally, how are special education services being provided in this environment? So, like, what are kind of some of the strategies put in place? Um, you know, uh, is Zoom conferencing with parents a good idea? Um, you know, for for those types of uh, supports with with kids, uh, how how uh, have you guys? I guess uh, the practitioners on the panel, what are the specific strategies you guys have been kind of using to make sure the kids get the, uh, the services? And then maybe um, those uh, representatives from DESE, what are things that you recommend or things that you've heard districts do? Um, so since we started implementing this week, this has been, um, I, I love that you say we're an expert, like this is just so <laughs> new for, <laughs> for all, like we're just so, just keep that in mind. This is our first week. I'm, I'm a four day old expert um, <laughs> on this. So, um, but one thing that we had a group meeting, a SPED team meeting, and we just said, you know, if these were our, if these were our kids, what would we want the teacher to do? Like what, how can we promise that we are doing the best we can to provide interventions during this time? Um, so we don't see all of this regression when we get back. And so one of the things that we all talked about is, providing interventions through Seesaw in a video. Um, and then just providing an example um, of, this is a time where you would stop and say, you know, prompt the parent to ask these questions um, so that you can do the intervention somewhat with fidelity. Um, so it keeps the kids still following that same pace of that intervention. So like, for example, you seeing stars and verbalizing and visualizing. Um, and so, we just run through that whole video. Um, we post the picture. We have a conversation. The kids know what to do, but it's just prompting parents to sit with them or, or they don't have to because the teacher will prompt the student as well. Um, it just kind of depends on what level of engagement the parent wants to have, but um, just making sure we're still providing those research-based interventions. Um, the other thing we had to take into account for this week, since Chromebooks didn't get handed out until yesterday, is providing opportunities um, for kids that don't have the internet. So we kind of broke our lesson plans down into three things, um, providing those videos of interventions, providing um, activities to do without the internet, and then just extra support activities, um, you know, like IXL or um, reading A to Z, just little things that they could do possibly outside of the intervention. Um, one of the things that we also talked about is sometimes parents don't realize um, necessarily what all you're providing a service for so they think it's reading but it may be basic reading and reading comprehension and reading fluency and so one of the things my team talked about doing is through seesaw um <laughs> sending them this is how many minutes is appropriate to work on this this is how many minutes we would spend on reading comprehension because you have parents that are stressed that their kids are going to regress and we just want to make sure that they're being appropriate not saying like here's a book read that for three hours <laughs> you know and so we just made sure to communicate with parents this is how much time we would spend on each area that they have a deficit on and this is what it would look like um and then like i said just kind of breaking down those lesson plans for the parents so that it's easy to implement here's a video of the intervention here's something to do with the internet something to do without the internet to support where they're at on their IEPs, their IEP goals. So. I think uh, here in Maribel, we haven't started, we're gonna start here uh, next week. Um, we've kind of tried to unload it this week as much as possible and have them go through each individual IEP, look at the goals and, and figure out how this is gonna work in a, a virtual learning platform. I think breaking down that individual individuality and talking with the parents and making sure that we're communicating back and forth is going to be a real big key in this. Um, because, could, because you're right, unless the parents is there and helping out, we have such a large age group from pre-K to, to high school, each one is going to look different in, in the delivery and, and the intervention. And so I think our biggest struggle is going to figure out how to get that when there's such a large grade level and in what interventions are going to work at the virtual level? What have we worked at? What have we done, you know, in the brick and mortar that's going to be successful that might transfer over to 
uh, a virtual learning platform. I think that's going to be our biggest struggle. And, and our other biggest struggle is, you're right, we have some students that just don't have that ability to learn vir virtually. How do we access those parents? How do we access those kids? And um, I don't, I don't know that I don't have a solid answer to that besides maybe providing hotspots or Chromebooks or, or something along those lines. It could be a, a, a mail home with a paper and pencil. So uh, any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. I know that some schools are providing, um, but you know, uh, they provide their Wi-Fi in the parking lots, and so they're allowing parents to come to the park, you know, pull up in the parking lot, and, yep. and they're also delivering meals out to the cars when they're doing that. So those are just some things that I've heard from districts that are using. Perfect. Thank you. That's absolutely a big, oh, a big challenge for us as well. So um, we're doing a lot of connection phone calls this week with all of our students across the district to find out what their connectivity availability is and who might not have uh, the ability to connect via devices. We are one-to-one -one, grades three and up. So we are very fortunate in that. And we had already asked our students to take, make sure they took their devices home with them prior to the spring break. Um, third and fourth graders did not previously have take home devices. Um, they were kept in their classrooms, but we went ahead and sent those home with third and fourth graders. So we're looking at our pre-K to second grade students who might be the ones feeding more of those learning packets. But this week we spent a lot of, our building administrators spent a lot of time collecting information on students who have connectivity needs and might need printed materials. And we're working on a plan district-wide on how it can be um, uh, gotten out to our students. Um, we are on a um, stay at home order in our county. And so we can't have our families coming up to schools to collect packets like we had originally hoped to in like a drive through method. So, um, but we do have buses that are currently going out into, into our community and serving meals. Um, we're serving almost a thousand meals a day. And we expect that to go up next week as we open that up, not just to our students, but to our, our students and their families um, to accept meals. So we're opening that up next week. So we do have some school buses traveling out and we thought about um, and, and a couple of school vans that we're probably going to use to do some porch deliveries on, on materials that might need to go home. But we're in the same boat. You know, we had to put some parameters on what general education looks like. And so they have some guidance on how many minutes they should be working on ELA or math um, per day. And they have some consistent district expectations on when that information needs to go out to families so they know what to expect for the week. Um, families are really interested right now with multiple phone calls, um, or they can be if we're not careful. I'm hearing from a classroom teacher, a case manager, a related service provider, and all of that. So we work with managers to try to be that collective person to make the special education phone call home to our, our families with our plan of services and talk to our families about what are their concerns in trying to provide the schooling at home because everybody's going to be different. I, t I told our staff that we can't can't help plan for every student for them. They have to make those decisions and make those adjustments as we get into the process. And we still have another week of planning we're able to do, which is really nice. Um, our, our, a lot of our related service areas already use therapy um, for our Medicaid billing. And so they have opened up a teleconferencing opportunity for our therapists to do a lot of um, therapy um, via Zoom is I think the platform that they're using as well. Um, you know, that that's, uh, fairly common place for speech therapy to happen that way. OT gets a little bit more difficult and PT gets super difficult. So we've talked about those flipped lessons and sending videos home. And we know our parents have smartphones and can take videos of their kiddos and um, doing different things. You know, you can work on as a physical therapist that alternating on steps much easier if a, a family has a basement than on our one floor school building sometimes. So I think at home we'll even find some new and unique opportunities on how to work with students. But we're really helping to train our our parents to now do the roles that we were doing as facilitators, education facilitators, and and even some of the role that our parents have played. We've talked about how we can have, walk parents through developing visual schedules for their kids at home um, and some things like that. So it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of adjustments. And I, I wish we had like the, um, the silver bullet for all of that, but we're using platforms like Seesaw, Google Classroom, uh, Canvas, as well, and then we are going to be using Google Hangouts. Um, we open that up for our students on their Chromebooks that they have at home. There's ways to videotape your sessions 
there and have that um, archive recording in our Google Vault. So we're doing that um, where we can kind of archive the chat windows and things like that. So um, we're continuing to look at it. And I tell our staff, I reserve the right to change my guidance when guidance changes around me. And we know that that's happening all the time right now. We just have to make those adjustments and, and say, okay, and move forward. So, all right. Um, I feel like uh, in a lot of ways we've touched on uh, the third bullet and uh, I have a feeling um, a lot of the questions that people have chatted in are going to be surrounding mainly that topic. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to Tom Hairston, Dr. Tom Hairston, um, who is a co-director of me and director of research. And, uh, and so um, I'm going to turn it over to him to go ahead and uh, bring out his list of questions. Excellent. Thank you, Curtis, and thank you to the panelists as well for uh, the information you've provided so far. Uh, thank you also to the participants uh, for the uh, questions that you have been asking. I've been doing my best to try and get those into some different broad topics so that our, our panelists can talk about those uh, topics and get to hopefully the different questions uh, within those. Uh, the first topic that's really been evident uh, that we're needing some questions answered on is the evaluation process, both initial evaluation, how do those either start or continue, uh, and then also the reevaluation process of if in both the reevaluation, if you were in the middle of reevaluations and everything came to a halt, or then as reevaluations come up, how do we uh, go about completing those reevaluations in a timely manner as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and start first a uh, conversation for panelists about those initial evaluations, uh, whether beginning an evaluation or continuing an initial evaluation in process or in progress, how do we uh, continue going through that process at this time? Okay, well, I'll jump on that one. Um, and just to give you a heads up, um, Compliance team is working on some frequently asked questions, Q&A document um, that's going to cover a lot of these same questions that are in this of webinar today. Um, and we'll get that out to you just as soon as we can. So one of the things we talk about is the evaluation timelines. So the same extensions that have always applied apply in, in this crisis. Um, when kids aren't available for testing, the, that's an acceptable reason to extend that initial evaluation timeline. Uh, gets a little dicier for the reeval folks, but remember you have several options for reevals. Um, if you have enough information to say this student continues to be eligible and needs special ed, and you can ride an IEP, teams can consider um, waiving the triennial. If you do that within the three years of your last reeval, you've met your timeline. And remember, one of the things, I don't know if it's a beautiful, beautiful thing or not about special ed is, um, you know, what you're doing, what you do at this time is only a good until the next time you do it. So it's the same with an IEP, it's the same with a reeval. The special ed process has, has built in you know, the ability to go back and address things again when you need to. Because, you know, even when there's not a crisis, uh, things change for kids, circumstances change for kids. And so that, that's already in there. So um, I, I just want to take this opportunity to say to you that how proud I am to be a Missourian and, and hear about all the great things that districts are doing to step up. And not just districts, but I mean, it's all you people out in the districts. So, I don't know, Dana, do you have anything there? Well, I mean, I go back to some of the federal guidance that's come out too. Um, the feds said, you know, the OCR and, and the Office of Special Ed said they're, they're, these are exceptional circumstances and they could affect how things would happen. And um, 
this is a national emergency is what they basically boiled down to and districts should be just constantly communicating when you have those things come up during the evaluation process and reevaluation process you need to be documenting and communicating that documentation um and vice versa with all those decisions that are being made so that's going to be the biggest thing in the end of it when we when when we see the light at the end of the tunnel is making sure you have that documentation Um, I would agree. I think going into this, my whole team realized the importance of documenting anything and everything that's communicated with parents, whether it's what kind of services, what kind of outlet do you want to, to, uh, for us to use, whether it's Seesaw or Google Classroom, um, documenting all of those, those things are really important. And then just having a conversation with them because at this point, um, there are kids that are due for a reevaluation that will, we would have liked to reevaluate. However, that's off the, <laughs> off the table at this point. And so just having that conversation with parents of, we're gonna do a triennial waiver for the sake of our due date, but please know that this is something we want to revisit when we return to school. And just being open and transparent that this is kind of the situation that we're in, but by all means, we plan to, you know, go back to the course of action that we had planned prior to an entire pandemic. So, um, and then, um, so that's our plan with reevaluations is just to do a triennial waiver for all of those and then just keep it. We have a spreadsheet of parent contact when we plan to resume that. Like, you know, is that really a, a triennial waiver we want to keep or is this something that we want to revisit when we return um, for initial evaluations? Um, if we hadn't made a determination on whether or not the we believe the student has a disability, we've done a notice of action refusal at this time. Um, if you're part of the Northwest RPDC, they sent out a sample of what that notice of action could look like. Um, and so we've used that template at this point. Um, if you need me to send that to anyone or if anybody would like to see that, I can send that. Um, but it's basically just saying that at this point, we can't make that determination because we're not capable of collecting any further data. Yeah, and a sales message also went out this morning because we finished and posted last night on the DESI website. Um, you know, on the DESI website, when you go to it, there's the top banner about the, the red thing. Yes, the red banner that says the COVID-19. And if you go underneath there and scroll down, there's different tabs. Under special ed, we released uh, something we call the continuity of instruction plan. And there's actually a longer name to it, but it's basically for districts to use as a model form. It's not required. But the continuity of instruction, it's called the Continuity of Instruction and Individual Education Program Implementation Plan. And it was really designed to help districts document services and other things that's going on during this time. We're going to definitely, now that we've seen that continuity of instruction, we're going to be implementing that, um, having our process coordinators probably keep up with that. I know some of my process coordinators are on this webinar, I'm probably hearing that for the first time out of my mouth, but. Surprise! <laughs> Surprise! But um, we had uh, already rolled out that uh, the case and CEC webinar from last Friday had like a, an individual documentation form for that e-learning during the COVID response, and so we had kind of modified that form. We had individual student documentation on our best efforts at providing FAPE and IDEA services, where we can maintain that communication log and what services we're providing, what the student response was, how we uniquely tailored that lesson based on an IEP goal or accommodation need. Um, so I've told our staff that, that that individual form for each student is so very important because that's how we're going to, I mean, that's what we're going to kind of come back to when we have to make some of those compensatory um, service decisions. And we know or think that we're going to have to do it on every student, but that's where our work in parent relationships comes in so importantly right now to be able to have those conversations so that parents understand where we're at, how we're trying to provide that service and knowing that we're, we want to hear from them and we want to adjust things as they see um, um, best works with their students. So Brittany, I can tell you definitely send out that notice. <laughs> I think you're getting a slew yeah. of those in the chat and I would love to yeah. see it as well. Yeah, <laughs> it has been, cause we had um, three referrals right before we left for spring break. And so that's been a lifesaver. I'm like, what do you put? What are we gonna write? You know, it, yeah, so it lays it out really nicely. So I can definitely send that out. Um, yeah, all right. So we, we, uh, we, thank you all uh, for that. And there has been uh, some follow-up. 
we'll work uh, with Brittany to make sure that uh, we get uh, something out to you about that and have that on our neeadvantage.com uh, write-up of this session as well. Um, I also want to go back and talk a little bit about assessment. There's been a few follow-up questions about would you uh, start the assessment process after that evaluation or hold off on uh, the assessment instead of things until things start coming back to a uh, normal type uh, situation again? I think for our district, we're going to err on the side of holding off on assessments. There's a lot of assessments that are going to be normed to um, any kind of virtual implementation. Um, when we have those opportunities, we may move forward, but right now, you know, students are successful for that reason. So for the most part, most of those are going to be paused on our end. Yeah, we're basically in the same boat. We're just going to wait. There's nothing that we can provide at this point assessment wise that's going to help with any qualifications. So Okay. Yeah, but I would also agree that's kind of the direction we're going in and, and uh, until things change, um, that's kind of what we have to do. If I can tell you one area that, or Dana, that we're really struggling with um, is our YCDD, um, our kindergarten kids who we might not have had those finished or unfortunately maybe started in a couple cases. And so um, I didn't know if you all had any guidance on that side of things um, before they hit first grade. Um, we do. That's actually in, in one of the questions in our question and answer document. Um, basically, our, our answer provides some strategies. Let me see if I can pull up my document here for you. Um, where I last saved it. Um, <laughs> I have it up if you want me to, to talk on that a little bit. Sure, go ahead, Dina. Okay, so um, with the white, with the, we're talking about the kid transitioning in. No, the no. ones that are in <laughs> kindergarten still with. Oh, so the YCDD. YCDD. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought we were talking about. I wanted to clear that up before I spoke. Um, you might have what you need. That, like you can go ahead and conduct a red meeting. And in that red meeting, when you either by conferring or alternate means, you, the team needs to determine um, three things. Do you have enough information to write a report to document the decision about eligibility, one of the other categorical eligibilities? So do you have enough already to write a report to document the decision? Do you have, the next thing is, um, are you able to confirm the student is a child with a disability who needs special ed services through an IEP? Do you have enough to do that? And then do you have enough to write an IEP? Because you might have what you need already. So if you do a red and then you have all those things, then you can go ahead and, and do an evaluation without assessment. So it really depends on what kind of quality stuff you you have coming for that child already. So each case is gonna have to be individualized when you look at that stuff. Well, and remember your deadline is before first grade. and I don't think anybody really knows, well, people may know, but I don't know if that anybody has any one plan for what the summer's going to look like, whether districts are gonna have to add um, contracted time over the summer or, or what's gonna happen to, to try to uh, close out this school year and get ready for the next one. So I guess just keep that in mind that and I, I say to my compliance team a lot, and I mean, just trying to get to, to like think about situations. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen if school starts and you've got a, a first grader that's still identified as YCDD? Um, they're still going to have an IEP with goals. They're still going to have services. Uh, you're still going to implement that, and you're going to take steps to get that reevaluation done as fast as you can when school starts, if you don't have it done before then, so. All right, uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope that uh, answers 
a lot of the general questions on the evaluations, the initial end reevaluation, and thank you again, Bev, for pointing out that there is going to be that Q and A uh, document as well that may answer some more in depth questions too. I do want to uh, go ahead and now move on to another topic. Uh, this one on the monitoring of monitoring of academic goals, of behavioral goals, and of minutes. Uh, and so I want to open it up. Uh, first, we'll talk the monitoring of goals at this point, uh, structures, processes, anything you're trying out, uh, panelists within your own districts, or uh, for those of you at DESE, any suggestions you have for how to uh, document, monitor uh, the academic and behavioral goals that may be on an IEP. Um, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think uh, the toughest one, I think, is going to be the behavior goals. And I think uh, what's going to be important that if we're communicating with parents, um, sending out a possible survey that, that they would fill out on a daily basis, we could still um, give direct instruction via Zoom or whatever else. I think collecting that data, especially in behavior, is going to be really tough. Um, a parent survey or, or just a data sheet that they can fill out, send back. I, I think that that's kind of the direction that we were going to go in as far as behavior. Um, I, I, again, um, like it was stated before, that parent involvement, I think, is going to be huge. Um, if we can get um, samples back from parents, writing samples, or, or just that kind of information, I, I think that's going to be the biggest piece. Yeah. Um, it's been just it's been tough because this is our first week just doing it. And so we didn't want to overwhelm parents with here's all the lessons you have to do. Um, or, you know, you may not have the internet. And so let's try to tackle, you know, we have some bigger issues. I feel like just getting them started than to kick oh. it off with data collection. And so this week has really been just getting parents used to it. A lot of them have never done Google Hangouts before. A lot of them have never seen their kids Google Classroom. And so we've spent a lot of this week, and I'm gonna be honest, we'll spend a lot of next week just building that rapport with parents so they feel like they can send us an email and say, I have no idea how to use Seesaw. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about on Google Classroom before we even hop into like, let's start monitoring some goals. <laughs> I mean, obviously all the lessons that we're providing are specific and individualized to that student to make progress so we do not regress on any of their goals but as far as monitoring I think that has not been at the forefront just because we know that the importance is getting the parents even involved to feel like they can handle educating their kids at home and probably like I said not next week but the week after that we have a staff meeting um, on Monday and it is going to be about monitoring and how we want to have that conversation with parents because I saw someone had mentioned in the chat, there are families that have more than one special education student. So they're getting calls from regular parents, they're getting calls from regular, um, from related service providers and caseload managers. So we wanted to just give parents a couple of days of just feeling like they can handle it before we throw something else on there. So um, yeah, so in about, we're gonna meet on Monday, have a conversation about monitoring those goals. Um, whether that's, let's Zoom with the students and go through um, doing our own data collection, which I think is probably what we'll look at doing. So that's something off the parents. Um, we're doing it via Seesaw. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, we don't have a good answer for that. It's just kind of where, meeting our parents where they're at um, to not overwhelm them and shut down completely, so. Definitely don't have a whole lot better either, Brittany. And <laughs> it is such a challenge um, because we realize that whatever we're sending home right now, we can't really monitor that with fidelity and know, you know, who. And that goes for any student right now, any student in general, like classroom. I don't know how you're gonna, how we're gonna for sure handle fourth quarter grading um, for students because we don't know who's doing the work, we don't know how much support they're requiring. We're um, standard based grading at our elementary levels, um, so it's going to be. It, we kind of know that fourth grade, fourth quarter grades are, are probably not going to be very um, accurate or um, really good. Um, and so we just have to, like you said, have those conversations with parents, and document that as best we can in our quarterly progress. Um, you know, those you know, Fed Track is our reporting system um, and our IEP system. And so when we when we go through there and there's drop 
breakdowns on you know, getting that addressed and making progress. And we're going to have to have a whole new box added for this particular incident. <laughs> it doesn't, it, you know, everything's compromised right now um, based off of the situation that we're in. And we're just trying to do the best in light of these extenuating circumstances. And knowing that parents at home are dealing with loss of job, uh, change in hours, they're working from home. Our teachers, my goodness, they're struggling even you know, managing a work at home environment. At home. I'm fortunate right now, I can still at least walk into the office and I don't have my 11 year old and five year old distracting me and needing my attention. But the reality is our teachers are dealing with that as well as our parents. And so we're just trying to be as sensitive to all of those other things happening in their lives. And we know that education is important and our goal is just to continue to try to move kids forward as best that we can. Um, and knowing that a lot of our kids, whether it's a special ed student or a gen ed student, we're gonna come back in the fall most likely, um, you know, with a, with a quarter less of learning, of true learning the way we wanna do it. So um, mm -hmm. we can't expect our parents to do it all for us by any means, but we want we want to empower them and give them the best tools that we can in the meantime. Yeah, and as far as the IP goals, I think it was Karen or Brittany mentioned earlier how critical that last data collection you did during your last time you had normal school is going to be. Um, and so just remember that you, you do have that. And when kids are able to return to school attendance, um, you'll take new baseline data for your goals at that time. Um, and that'll help you shed light on whether anything you collected in the interim was accurate or whether it should have a little asterisk beside it. Um, and, and help you make decisions as a team about, you know, whether or not any compensatory services are needed and, and how, how much that would be. It's too much to think about right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, it is. But think about your fall. If you have that in your back pocket. <laughs> what kind of um, initial evaluation requests could we be getting in the fall because we've had so many kids miss out on a whole quarter of learning? Um, so we're going to have to be sensitive as a district on how we're going to play catch up. We're, we're talking about that, how summer school might look different once we finally get some all clears to resume some education of some sort, moving. Into, I mean, we're having all kinds of conversations and, um, and they change daily and our, our mood and our, our, uh, our, you know, our thought process on it even changes on, we don't know what's best because we don't know what's to come right now and we just have to continue to adapt to do its best in the long run. There right. might be Those a lot of, as I say, there might need to be a lot of RTI, the risk, you know, collect data collection in the fall when everyone can get back to school. I was just going to say the same thing. Those of you that are already using a strong RTI model, you've already, you already have a way to handle those requests. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those. I want to get now into uh, something that we kind of touched on just a few minutes ago, the situation of now working closely with parents and especially uh, parents that may not be responding uh, for whatever reason that may be, whether it's um, parents themselves being overwhelmed, not having the time, parents refusing service. Maybe it's that there's not a lot of technology available at the home of the student. Um, how do we go about uh, working or what suggestions do you all have to uh, get signatures or what, how may we be able to document that we held this meeting, it was over the phone um, or it was over a Zoom meeting, but the parent has signed off on this. Uh, what type of strategies, uh, suggestions do you all have for uh, that type of communication and overcoming some of the obstacles uh, when we do face non-response type situations. Well, that new, Desi State, that new Desi State form has a parent contact log option and we are um, requiring that for our individual student documentations to document that response, whether it's a student or parent response or that non-response. And then the action we take, okay, I'm gonna say this too many times, in response 
to their non-response. <laughs> so we're just trying to make sure that we've documented all the efforts that we've made in good faith to try to provide services, but we do know that, I mean, it's not just our kids that aren't going to perform work. There's going to be students in our gen ed classrooms that aren't going to perform work. And we're just going to document that the best we can. And then, you know, when we come back and have those conversations about do we need compensatory services and things like that, you know, we'll have to take those things into account. And I can't tell you what our decisions will be right now on that until we kind of work through some of those situations. But um, that is certainly a concern and one that we've talked about. But I think as long as we're continuing to make our best effort and documenting our efforts on that front, um, that's the best we're going to be able to do. And I would agree. I think I'm very fortunate where I'm at because my caseload managers already had great relationships with their parents. They worked really hard this whole year establishing those. And so it has not been um, common that our parents aren't responding to our caseload managers because they've already had that rapport. And so they're doing a really great job of answering and talking to them. Um, and then I think our caseload managers have done a good job um, just realizing where parents are at. Um, there are some that are really, they're in survival mode right now. <laughs> and so it's just one of those things of, you know what, here's where you can access this information. And then maybe why don't I just talk to you again next week when things slow down? Or when's a good time to call you back and have that and have a better conversation about this? You seem really overwhelmed right now. Just, I mean, really the real, it, it's relationships at this point that matter the most in my eyes, because I think that's where you're going to get your parents to actually respond. Um, and so sometimes it's frustrating for us as educators because we've lost all of our control and we just think about all the kids that are not getting any sort of education for the next four days or five days. And then you just sit there and think about, oh my gosh, we've done so much this year, but really just trying to remember and, and just validating parents at, when you talk to them, it, or just email them and so that you get a chance to say, you know what, I know you have a lot on your plate and this is really frustrating. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. And and hopefully they do reach back out to you. Um, that's my soapbox. I'm just, <laughs> but it, it, that's been one of our biggest things just as teachers is I know you're frustrated and you know the kids who probably you're not gonna hear from their parents and you know that they're not gonna probably work to the level that you want them to, but you just have to be patient and you have to be um, just, sympathetic to the situation um because this is probably not the parents ideal situation at all um and so we've worked really hard on, on just building those um relationships and maintaining those even during this time but then just documenting like you said um you know these are the conversations we've had this is what you've agreed to i mean there's no way to get signatures at this point um because we're on lockdown you know so we can't go anywhere um but we I mean, we're just documenting, documenting, and documenting everything. And then um, as soon as we know, you know, for sure when we will get back and having that conversation about what does ESY look like, what does compensatory services look like, we will communicate with parents what our plan is. But since we don't have one right now because we don't know when we're returning, um, we're just, again, reiterating to parents that the importance um, of our communication is for the good of their student. And, and more times than not, we we get a response eventually not maybe as soon as we like but we get one <laughs> you know you right. can always ask for parents to confirm what their decision was via email too mm -hmm. you know if they have access to computers if they have a smartphone they can always send you a quick email you know or you could write them an email saying this is what we discussed because a lot of them are overwhelmed when we're talking to them over the phone and they've got kids yelling at them and yanking at their leg and everything else so a lot of times when you have that conversation on the phone, it's always good to follow up with an email if you can, and then have their response be their affirmation of what the discussion was. Yeah, that's and, right. As far as compliance goes, there's not very many times where you need an actual signature to give prior written consent. So unless you are um, doing an initial evaluation with assessment or a reeval with assessment, um, or need a consent for initial services, um, you, you don't have to worry about getting their signature. Um, and you could, during those times, you can send stuff by mail and you may or may not get a response. Um, the other thing you need consent for, which our whole team collectively groaned on our uh, Zoom the other day uh, when someone mentioned was um, IP meaning excusal. So that's the other time. And that one's problematical. Um, 
you can you can try getting it through the mail if if you need an excusal of an IP team member and you're trying to convene IP teams. But I guess uh, my suggestion is, since you're going to be doing that by alternative means anyway, um, figure out a way to get somebody to fill every role on that call or video conference or however you're doing it. Hey, um, Bev, as far as the signature stuff goes and compliance, we've had um, a couple of people ask about DocuSign, an electronic signature. Would that um, be something that would be that that would be usable over this virtual learning platform? You know, I don't know that there's any guidance out about that, um, but I can research it. I if I guess it'll probably come down to um, are you, does that satisfy the signature requirement? And does for a whole lot of purposes. I know I just completely refinanced my mortgage all electronically and DocuSign my whole life away. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll write down a note to do some research on that. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And when we're working on the relationships with the parents in this communication, don't forget to, to reach out, have the parents, give the parents the information for impact. There's so much, and they're being overwhelmed with so much that the resources of impact would probably be very helpful to them. All right, thank you all for that. I wanna move on to our next topic now. Um, and that's about uh, services that are typically provided by a private, private agency or a state school. At this time, what does the school of residence for uh, that student need to provide if that state school is closed or if uh, that private agency is no longer providing services? Um, I'll, I'll handle that question. So as far as private agencies, those are contractual agreements between school districts that place kids there and those agencies. So they'll want to uh, examine those contracts carefully. Um, and, and within that, follow all the same guidance um, as far as, you know, basically you need to know what's going on with them. Because when things resume to normal, we're hoping they will, um, you're still responsible for making sure that that IEP was implemented or, you know, basically you're responsible for FAPE for those students, whether you serve them directly or not. So you'll want to make sure that that agency has a place in process or a process in place to do all the things that you guys are going to have to do with your students. And you'll be partners in that since it's a really a joint accountability. Um, and really, this is the same for the state board operated programs. Um, I did talk with uh, Samantha at MSSD briefly yesterday, and um, they're pushing out uh, resources for teachers to make contact with kids and things while they're out um, and, and exploring options and things. But um, and we talked about this in our compliance uh, meeting earlier this week by Zoom, that for kids like at MSSD, MSD, and MSD, um, you know, nothing happened with their IEPs to change placement. They're pretty much in the same boat as everybody else. And those agencies um, are gonna have to figure out what services need to be provided while school's out and go about doing that and documenting it um, or documenting basically whatever happened and then when instruction can be provided in schools again uh, use that process for using the student performance data to make good decisions about uh, what, whether or not compensatory services are owed and, and how much and, and when to provide those. Okay. Uh, for that explanation as well. Uh, that moves us to uh, the next topic 
um, next major topic and the last major topic that I was able to uh, kind of bring together. And that's in terms of early childhood special education. So what type of what type of materials, what type of resources, what type of strategies have you all figured out? Um, or have you all tried uh, for early childhood special education? Um, and a couple of subtopics here uh, in regards to autism and also in regards to uh, first steps as well. I, well, okay, so I'll try to jump in here. So <laughs> I've got a great process coordinator who handles a lot of our early childhood special ed side of things, but um, our early childhood program already used Seesaw. And so that is definitely gonna be a resource I know that they're gonna tap into as far as sending home uh, video lessons or being able to communicate with their families back and forth. And um, we're in an integrated classroom setting. So they're also doing that for their integrated students as well. Um, but again, just trying to find ways to address those goals. The great thing about early childhood is play is such an important piece of what we're working on with those kids. And I think they're going to be getting a little bit of that at home for a while because um, the parents are just busy handling other things as well. So um, we're going to ask those teachers to still do like a bi-weekly check-in um, times a week um, just to be making sure that um, they're connecting with their kids, their families, seeing you know, what supports that they might need. We've even talked about, you know, all of our kids left all our school supplies here at schools. So we've talked about finding ways to get supplies home to kids if they don't have them um, through our, our meal delivery routes and things like that. So um, this is an age where some of that might come into effect more. Um, I'm, I don't, I can't answer the piece on first steps. I know that they're trying to, I feel like there was um, some things happening pretty recently about trying to figure out how to handle all those third birthdays that might be happening before school is able to resume and things like that. But, you know, our early childhood teachers are approaching it the same way as a lot of our K-2 teachers and trying to send some activities home and doing some things with them and, and those frequent connections with families. Karen, I'm so glad you went first. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to. I know, I was like, I'm not talking first. Um, so, um, cause I wanted to see what you said. So, um, and now I feel a lot better about our plan. Um, so we're basically doing the exact same thing um, that we are doing K-12. Um, the important thing I think that we um, are doing with Seesaw is, again, just explaining, um, you know, what makes an effective um, read aloud? How can you stop and ask questions? You know, just modeling for parents um, and then, but like they're doing a read aloud and they're just modeling how you can question throughout that. Just supporting parents if they wanna do that on their own time, but then also providing a resource if parents need a break and they're like, you know what, you read to my kid for a little bit. <laughs> and so um, they've done um, an amazing job. I um, have three teachers um, at the ECSC level and they have, gotten together they each did a week of lessons um, they put all the materials list together and they shipped up those materials out so all of those kids have all the materials to do the lessons if they choose um, and so those are all without the um, use of the internet um, and all the parents have the app so they can access the app um, and they have all of the like I said all the resources and materials to to build or to do whatever to complete the lessons um, but then just also extra enrichment ideas um, we are struggling um, a little more with the kids, like Craig had mentioned, that have extreme behaviors. Um, and so I've told um, those case managers to make sure that you're really supporting those parents during this time and just what are some tools and strategies that you use? Because if they're going to try to implement um, these lessons, they're probably going to need to know exactly <laughs> the behavioral supports that you've put in place. And so um, not to overwhelm them, but to just remind parents that you're here as a resource for them as well um, to kind of support them through that behavioral portion. So, but otherwise I, yeah, we're, we're kind of just sticking with the same thing that we're doing K-12. Also glad that uh, you ladies went first because I am not <laughs> the uh, early childhood coordinator either, but I think our biggest uh, concern was supply and how do we get that stuff home? Um, what we have also been doing is, is we've had meal pickup and trying to coordinate that with, with our early childhood um, um, families. Um, and I agree with their, whatever, the, everything else they said, spot on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Uh, thank you all for that. And also thank you to the participants that have been responding to these questions with their own suggestions, their own ideas, uh, and ways that they're tackling within their school district uh, some of the uh, solutions as well. Uh, the final thing uh, that I want to get to, as this is a question that has come up, is uh, some of the other services. Uh, when we think about occupational therapy, um, PT, uh, speech language uh, therapy. What type of what type of services? What type of structures um, resources are being utilized? If you know of uh, for those uh, services as well. We're kind of at the beginning stages of, of building that. I think the easiest, not the easiest, but I think our OT or our, our speech people are starting to set up uh, um, their communication, recording it and trying to either do it a recorded uh, message or allowing um, a, a small group instruction. I, I think our OT was having trouble with, with the, that supply aspect too. How do we get uh, stuff home to the parents and, and how, do we, how do we progress monitor that? So we're, we're, we're still in, in the building process, but I think those uh, is kind of the direction we're going in right now. We're very similar as well. So SLP, we're, we're gonna be doing a lot of things through our therapy log application so that they can do some teleconferencing. Um, our OTs are, I'm meeting with them on Monday. So I don't know that, I know entirely what their plan is, but I know that they're working together to talk about how um, kids can use things that they have at home and that they can utilize things that are commonplace in a household. And um, they're also collecting some information on what kids might need access to some of those supplies and things. Um, we did a Zoom conference with our physical therapy folks um, yesterday, and they're pretty overwhelmed with how to make all of this work. And we talked through some suggestions on, on things that they can do. Um, Seesaw being definitely an application that a lot of us are familiar with, or just a lot of those, um, a lot of physical therapy, you got to see what the kids were doing. And so we just talked a lot about, you know, getting videos sent to and from and things like that for them to model with a parent um, what this needs to look like. One thing that we're really struggling in, in figuring out how we want to handle is kids who have um, some pretty significant equipment that they have here at school as far as standards and things like that. That we, you know, we had kind of a re regimen that they were on as far as um, when they were in their standard and when they were in their wheelchair and some things like that. And so with parents not having access to those things that we, we that are school owned, we're trying to figure out what's our plan. We're going to loan those things out. But we're also very cautious of anything that we're sending home are those things that we're going to want back. We need to be okay with maybe not getting everything back or um, having a plan for how we're going to clean those things when they come back. So like we're, we're having those conversations on so many different levels as far as our tech stuff once it comes back or um, our physical equipment that we or supplies that we send home or our library books that have been sent home how we might want those back with um, knowing what this virus can do and some things. So again, don't have those answers to that. We're still trying to process through how we're going to quarantine all the stuff we end up getting back for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as how Plattsburgh's handling it, um, we're doing a weekly conference with each student that receives related services just to check in to see how they're doing, um, either with their parent um, or with the student um, and their parent together. Just how are you um, working through the things that we gave you? And then just to check in, kind of like a data, just a therapy session, basically, um, just to see how they're progressing there. If they are struggling with a particular um, assignment provided or activity provided, I should say, or if there's any questions by the parent, they wanted to do weekly um, Google Hangout meetings uh, with those parents and with those students just to see how they're kind of progressing um, with the therapy. Um, and then just to, again, kind of like you said with the equipment, do you feel like you need some additional equipment for this task? Do you feel like you can, you know, and then, um, or do you have some of these resources already available to you? And it's funny because, you know, even, our occupational therapist said there's so many great things like, you know, that you don't realize that they have um, within their home, like utilizing the steps and doing these things. So they've gotten really crafty and resourceful when it comes to providing therapy within the home. Um, and so we have not had, again, this is only week one and today they're doing well, some of them probably have already started um, doing their parent check-ins. And so I'm curious to see how the parents feel like therapy is going. Um, and, and just, again, it's, 
it really is hard to, to say that we have a for sure plan because it'll probably change by Monday and then that plan will probably change by Friday. So um, we're just trying to meet the, the needs of the students and the parents. And, and you're right, like if they need the equipment, I mean, Plattsburgh probably is just gonna give that equipment and we'll have to figure out what we wanna do, but it's better to provide it and do what's best for the student and, and then we'll figure out the rest later. All right. Hey guys, I want to thank you all, especially our panelists, uh, for taking this time out and helping Missouri um, as a whole um, educate our students and provide the services that are needed. So uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Um, as far as some of the uh, documents uh, that were asked about, we'll try to make sure we can get those out to everybody. Um, at least, you know, be able to provide some kind of a link or provide it on our website. Um, I see Dana just went ahead and put a, a link down um, in the chat if that's something you guys want to click on there and, and try to get to. Um, so again, thank you, uh, panelists. Um, before everybody goes, I want to um, invite you guys to some uh, other upcoming webinars uh, on Monday. Uh, March 30th at 11 o'clock, we'll be doing a um, conversation with Todd Whitaker uh, for leading with uh, um, leading in difficult times. Uh, a link um, to this uh, is been posted in the chat by Kendra, and so um, you can get on there and register for that one um, if you want, and then also. Um, next Wednesday, April 1st at one o'clock, conversation on remote learning resources and support. And so uh, that would be uh, another one that would be similar to this format where we're going to have a panelist of, of people and questions be able to um, be typed in and, and answered. So with that said, again, uh, thank you all so much um, for joining us. and. Um, Kendra, is there anything you uh, wanted to add before we uh, before we get off? Nope, I think I'm good. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Great discussion. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Stay strong. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>